Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our panel uh, today in Delphi Economic uh, Forum is on uh, the Western Balkans, and the question we're going to answer, we'll try to answer, is stability or friction? What's the future for this turbulent area? And we are very honored uh, to have uh, here today with us the esteemed uh, speakers. Hello to everybody. We welcome uh, Mr. Fatmi, Fatmir Biteki, uh, Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs from uh, North Macedonia. Hello. Mr. Miroslav Lajczak, EU Special Representative for the Belgrade Pristina Dialogue and Western Balkans. Hello, Mr. Lajczak. Mr. Gabriel Escobar, Deputy Assistant Secretary from Bureau of European and Eurasi Eurasian Affairs. Mr. Kurt Volker, Distinguished Fellow and former U.S. Special Representative. And uh, Mr. Marco Cades, President at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Serbia. <coughs> Hello to everybody. So let me begin with uh, Mr. Bitiki. Uh, Mr. Bitiki, you are the Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs uh, of uh, North Macedonia. And in 2021, the Western Balkans saw a faster than expected recovery from the COVID-19 induced recession. But the Ukrainian war threatens this optimistic trend. What are your financial tools in order to tackle this new crisis? Well, thanks for first uh, having me here today and having the opportunity to speak about uh, some of the things that we have done all of us in Western Balkans last year, but as well speaking about the new challenges. Actually, I think that what we did in Western Balkans, and I will not speak uh, only of North Macedonia, is a uh, lesson learned from uh, other areas. Actually, we saw what and how the other regions in the past crisis have dealt with the crisis and what was the failure of them to uh, accelerate their growth, and we did the opposite, meaning that uh, we took the lesson learned, we understand quite clearly what is our economy, economic structure of each of uh, the country itself, and furthermore, uh, it is uh, interesting that in 2021, even though that most of the countries in EU, EU or outside of EU were focused on themselves, we said that uh, we should focus on each other, meaning that uh, regional cooperation should be enhanced in order to bring uh, faster growth. And that's, I think, that uh, the receipt that uh, actually made us to have uh, such a fast growth after 2020 and uh, the first year of uh, being quite quite uh, hard from uh, COVID-19. And I think that 2021 brought several good initiatives that actually uh, gave good results. Unfortunately, not all of the countries in Western Balkan uh, were part of the initiatives, or they were part of certain initiatives, certain forms, but not of the other forms, because actually still in Western Balkan we are facing too much politics into and mixing with the economy which is something, uh, it's a challenge ahead that we want uh, and we have to, to fight in the upcoming years. Because economy doesn't uh, go uh, together with the politics. And I would say maybe later on I will speak about the polit politics and new policies that we have to uh, bring forward. And I think that North Macedonia is an example to be followed because uh, uh, we have behind today, I'm in the country that uh, not... Uh, Far than four years ago, probably most of the politicians would uh, have hard to, to have the space to talk about and to talk about the regional cooperation because of dispute that was uh, long, uh, lasting for, uh, for decades. But uh, we overcome it uh, because we thought that the new politics is something that we have to bring on table and actually through dialogue we achieve what we have uh, today. We are seeing North uh, Macedonia and Greece as the biggest cooperators and collaborators on economic growth of both countries, even though we are at the beginning, I would say, of it. But all those small initiatives are actually the response to your uh, question why Western Balkan and North Macedonia succeeded to have an accelerated growth in 2021. Nevertheless of that, I think that uh, the challenge ahead that we have 
uh, is something to, be, to, 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 to bear and to see as an opportunity for all, all of us. And probably uh, after the other colleagues that are today with the pan in the panel with me, I would uh, have the chance to, to see it. But uh, the last thing that I would uh, actually say is that uh, the COVID was just seen as a challenge and not a problem. And because the problem seeks, uh, seeks uh, conflict and the challenge seeks uh, partnership and collaboration. And that's the last thing that I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Leitzak, uh, European enlargement policy underlines the necessity to invest in uh, stability, peace and peace. Your role is to achieve the normalization of uh, relationship uh, between Serbia and Kosovo and uh, generally to promote uh, reconciliation between neighbor countries in the in Balkans. Do you believe that the Ukrainian uh, war has waken up any nationalist voices in Balkans or the opposite? Well, the Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, has changed many things we have belie believed in or, or we have been taken for granted, starting from the world order and, and uh, the post-Cold War uh, arrangement up to the feeling that uh, the Western Balkans are in a safe place and there are no challenges to their peace, security and stability. Now, no one, nothing can be taken for granted and uh, the war in Ukraine has uh, woken up the understanding uh, among the European Union member states that we need to bring the, the region significantly closer to the membership and they must not have the feeling that they are lost some, somewhere in between, uh, in, in the middle of the process. So the war, as tragic as it is, has created a positive momentum uh, in uh, the Western Balkans and also between the European Union and, as, and the Western Balkans. And also when we speak about bringing Ukraine closer to the European Union, everybody understands that this cannot be done uh, to the detriment uh, or in ignoring the Western Balkans. That means th if there is a push of the Ukraine towards EU, then of course the Western Balkans should be part of this process. So I would say these are the positive elements. Uh, uh, I don't see uh, nationalistic voices being woken up. I would rather say that they uh, have been silenced because uh, clearly uh, the reaction, first the, the brave response of Ukrainian army and Ukrainian citizens, but also uh, very resolute coordinated uh, activities of the European Union, United States and, and, the, and the civilized world shows that uh, you cannot bully your way and you will be punished for that. And therefore, these people got scared in a way. And, and it's, re it's really important that we prevail uh, because simply what Russia has been doing in Ukraine is not acceptable and must be clearly demonstrated as not acceptable. Uh, what we need to do is now to turn this momentum uh, into something tangible. And when I speak about tangible things, of course, the, the most imminent is to start accession negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. And uh, this uh, momentum will not last beyond June. Uh, beyond the French presidency, so therefore we, we, we hope to see uh, the, 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 this positive outcome in June. And also the message uh, from the EU towards the region is that yes, there is a momentum, we see you and we understand that all this we are talking about is political, not technical, but the second message is we don't want you to be part of our solution, we, don't, we have no capacity for you to be part of our problem. So therefore we also want to see uh, positive news from the region and we want to see the region sending messages that they can address their problems in a constructive spirit. We are always happy to help and to assist, but uh, uh, sitting and waiting for someone from outside to come and solve the regional problems would be the recipe for disaster and it, this would be the way how we will miss or waste this momentum that has been created. Okay, thank you. Mr. Escobar, uh, Mr. Leitzak uh, said that the future of Western Balkans is inside the European Union. But we have seen that uh, the EU is putting the Western Balkan countries in a waiting room. And there was more uh, room for Turkey to broaden its influence in this area. If EU accession does not speed up, uh, Western Balkan leaders could turn towards Turkey and away from the EU. What's your opinion? My opinion is that these countries are tied to Europe. They can't turn away from Europe. But at the same time, Europe can't turn away from them. The countries of the Western Balkans are European. They are culturally European, historically European, and increasingly economically European. Uh, so I think 
that that is a bond that cannot be broken. Uh, additionally, uh, the publics are oriented toward Europe. When people leave the Balkans, they don't go to Turkey. They don't go to Russia. They don't go to China. They go to Europe. So this is, they know this is where their future is. But at the same time, I would say that the defining characteristic of the Western Balkans in the view of the American government is that they are a zone of opportunity. If you look at the uh, seven countries of the former Yugoslavia, they've been uh, successful in many respects. Two of them are members of the European Union, and four of them are members of NATO. In the Western Balkans, that is, the ones that are still not in the European Union, but which we hope someday will, someday very soon, you have three members of NATO and you have four on a solid European Union membership track. Additionally, the one thing that characterizes the Western Balkans today is phenomenal economic growth. The uh, economy of Serbia has grown seven times in 20 years. Uh, Montenegro and Kosovo have registered double-digit growth. Albania is approaching that and North Macedonia has extremely good macroeconomic numbers. So what they are, is there an opportunity for Europe because they will be a regional energy hub. They will be a, a hub for transportation, shipping, IT, uh, and they are strategically located in a part of the world that we need to pay more attention to. So uh, in fact, I think that even though these countries are already oriented to Europe, I think more and more Europe is gonna have to start to see the opportunities that are present in the Western Balkans. And our experience in dealing with the countries of the Western Balkans through NATO, particularly Albania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia, is that they are good partners. They're solid partners. They contribute to, uh, to the alliance. And this is what Europe can expect from the Western Balkans. They can expect them as members of the European Union to be solid partners, to be committed partners, uh, and partners that can be counted on. So, no, I think in reality, uh, this crisis will actually bring the Western Balkans and Europe closer. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Volker, historically we have seen a power struggle in the area of uh, Western Balkans. Are Balkan countries the apple um, of discord between EU, USA and Russia? And why is this area so important geopolitically? Right, well, I think the US and the European Union are on the same side here and Russia is the outlier. And I think that uh, we had, until recently, some worrying trends in the Balkans uh, about uh, rising nationalism and potential for fragmentation. And I think that what we've seen with the war in Ukraine, or Russia's war against Ukraine, has been a, a reminder, if you will, that it's reminded us what violence looks like how awful it is and how we can never go back there. It's reminded us the destructiveness of a type of nationalism that rejects the identity of others, uh, which is what we see with Russia's efforts to exterminate Ukraine and what we've seen in the past in the Balkans. And uh, a reminder, therefore, that everything everyone has said so far is exactly right. The only way forward is the integration of the entire region into Europe uh, on the basis of shared values, uh, respect for multi-ethnic or multi-ethnicity, respect for different languages, cultures, confessions. Uh, all of that is the, the European basis that uh, will bring the, the Balkans together. If I can just draw a few other lessons from the war against Ukraine for the Balkans region. Um, one of the reasons we're having this war is because we left them in a gray zone. Uh, they, they were not part of NATO, not part of the EU, uh, and a temptation for Russia. And so I think what everyone here is saying about integration into Europe is important because it eliminates uncertainty. Uh, and I think that's important to do. Uh, I mentioned the idea of inclusiveness. It's got to be everybody. There's, there's no, well, this country and that country, but not that country, or be or different ethnic groups. It's got to be uniform. It's got to be everybody. Uh, and finally, I think we're also learning what we kind of already knew in our hearts, but we didn't want to say it too much, was that energy is more than just a means of powering our economies. It is a tool of political leverage uh, for potential even domination of some states over others. 
And so as we sort out the EU's posture on energy in the future, and I believe that they will be soon deciding to uh, put an embargo on Russian oil and soon, but with more time, getting off of Russian gas, I think the Balkans has to be completely in sync with that energy picture as well. Uh, it has to be aligning with the EU, uh, reducing any reliance on Russian oil or gas, and connecting to a, a European energy future. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Cadez, Mr. Volker said that our mistake is that we left the Balkan countries uh, in, a, in a gray zone for many years. And uh, several factors the last uh, 15 years, uh, from the financial crisis to refugees, and um, recently Brexit and relations with Russia diverted the EU's attention uh, from the Western Balkans. What are your proposals in order to see Western Balkan countries integrating much faster in the EU, especially concerning the single market? Yeah. So basically, totally right. Now we can see in this uh, crisis times how hard it is to decouple economical challenges security challenges or political challenges from each other. So uh, basically we can, in the normal times, we can speak about, you know, what are the economical challenges of one country or one region or union or whatever. But now we have to think how to integrate all the aspects of the challenges that we have. And if you have this in mind, uh, let's put aside economical and security challenges, let's see the political. The Somehow, aside in opposite to business people, the political administrations are always thinking, you know, there is a crisis, the things will settle down, and afterwards we will come back to the normal. That is somehow like administrations always thinking, and it is never coming up to the normal. So it never came up to the normal after the financial crisis, it never came back to the normal after COVID, it never came back to the, after refugees. There is always some equilibrium afterwards. This is, this is the terms of physics, especially end of business, because there is no coming back. And I think we have in this, having this in mind, we have to think what are the proactive moves that we all together on the European continent can do to move the continent in the right direction. And, you know, if you want to have accomplished project, a project of Europe cannot be accomplished without accomplishment of the Western Balkan countries into the structure of European Union. How to do it? We have the process since 2003. So I repeat, it is not two years, it is not 12 years, it is the 20 years, about giving Western Balkans European perspective on some, on the same side process, which actually was good at that time, but now the world changed. Not now because of the war in Ukraine, the world changed before, many times, but we are still on the same process. So basically, uh, not back to normal, but see how we can move forward. And I think we as a business community, and I'm not talking about Serbian business community only, I'm talking about business community in Macedonia, in Kosovo, in Serbia, in, in, in uh, Macedonia, in North Macedonia, and in Montenegro. They're all very clear in mind. Let us talk with the European partners and let us redefine the process so that we can really uh, see the reforms in our countries much quicker, that we can see uh, the, the tangible results for all the citizens and for our companies. And there is a clear proposal. So what we, 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 we call it uh, 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 the new way or new approach of, uh, of, of the way or, or European path, let us talk about two-step systems. Let us say, OK, of course, the full membership is the way to go ahead. It is a very, very complex process, but let us put the two-step process. Let us say, okay, let us open the negotiation about uh, common uh, a European economy market. Let us call it Southeast Economic Treaty, Southeast Economic Community or whatever, where we have a clear defined models and we are not reinventing the wheel. That is something what happened with Finland, that is something what happened with Austria before they became the members, that is something Iceland is living now or Norway is living now. So just to be ready to say, yes, this is the part of Europe which belongs to Europe. And then we can speed up all the processes. And I'm totally really sure that this kind of process to convince the European Union to start the negotiation on Southeast Economic Area, or how you call it, to, to, to meet the main goal to enable full freedoms 
of movement of goods, people, capital, as soon as possible, which means in very, very quick period of time, and then to go further and to, to work on the full membership when it is ready on the sides of all, all, all sides. But it, it brings actually dynamics, the new dynamics uh, for all the parties. And then the political solutions could be easier. Also the solutions like negotiations between, between uh, uh, Serbia and Kosovo could be much more easier if you have the perspective, if the people who are dealing with this issue have the perspective, if you see what can be done, because this is then the new normal. We will not come back to the night 2003 and the same old song of the you know, European perspective for the Western Balkans, which we are singing for 20 years, but actually nothing is moving. Okay. And uh, Mr. Bitiki, let's talk a little bit about uh, Greece and North Macedonia, because you mentioned uh, the strong economic uh, cooperation between the two countries. Do you consider the PRESPA agreement as a valuable tool in order to strengthen the economic uh, cooperation between uh, our countries? Well, I would say that uh, the PRESPA agreement should not be seen as a tool only. It is a way of uh, conflict to use as an opportunity, as a challenge in order to start the collaboration. And actually, we did it. 27 years, we had a dispute. And for different reasons, for different influences, someone internally, someone externally, didn't want the, the dispute to be solved. And the new politics that I, I said at the beginning uh, brought actually the compromise reached on two sides. Still, there are things to be worked, but uh, every agreement is not uh, one step uh, ahead to, to be reached. There, are, there is a process ahead in which both sides has to do certain things. But the first thing that we said is, okay, let's talk the walk. Let's bring now the economic perspective to our citizens and say what we might bring. Almost two years ago, in Delphi Economic Forum, we announced that we want to become part of Alexandropoulos terminal, LNG terminal, floating one in FSRU in Alexandropoulos, and uh, gas power plant. Back home, everyone started talking why we are doing such a, a decision, because uh, we have gas already in our country. Nevertheless, and not speaking, that we are the only country in Western Balkan who, who is 100% dependent on, on Russian gas. But two years ago, because of the conflict was not existing, no one was caring about it. But we said no, because the diversification is a mean how to increase the competitiveness of your economy and bring to your citizens a better life. And actually, press by agreement, I think, should be seen a way as a model of reaching, uh, reaching agreement and bringing prosperity for the both uh, countries. Normally, it brings an opportunity. And I would say that actually, a small initiative that might, might sound as a small and our involvement in FSIU in Alexandropoulos is a way how we should do all together in, in, in the region. Because now instead of talking on regional com competition, we, we are talking on regional com on competitiveness. Instead of uh, uh, caring about only ourselves, we are talking on the value chain in Western Balkan, including Greece, including member states in the Southeast uh, Europe. And now, because of the conflict in Russia and Ukraine, actually we are seeing that that's uh, a possibility for all of us, an opportunity to use and bring the value, uh, value chain and near shoring towards European uh, market and towards European uh, countries. This is what PRESPA agreement actually uh, brought. And this is the spirit that should be actually uh, brought to other conflicts in the region that we are having. That we, we know that... Uh, uh, Actually, looking behind is always maybe easier, but looking ahead is something that we have to fight every day and showing to our kids. Because uh, unfortunately, as I used to say always in my country and throughout uh, the possibilities that I have, our, ki our kids, all of us, 10 years after today, they will not blame us on why we didn't do it, but why we didn't undertake anything for their future. Unfortunately, in Western Balkans, we have seen uh, quite a lot of politicians, quite a lot of uh, foreigners, politicians from EU or other countries, for different reasons,
putting the, the area in, in the gray zone. I think now we have to use the momentum of geopolitical influence that Western Balkan had to be there where it, it, it belongs. It belongs, as Mr. Escobar said, fully in European Union with all the opportunities that they might bring and they might bring an additional value. They might bring the colorfulness as a country itself, as a nation. They might bring a higher competitive economy of Europe. Okay, so I'm asking uh, Mr. Leitzak also, uh, from your experience, do you think that PRESPA agreement can be an example for conflict resolution in the broader area of uh, Western Balkans? Yes, absolutely. Uh, because I have to say that the European future of the Western Balkans has never been questioned, uh, particularly never since 2003. But the fact also is that uh, 19 years later, uh, we only have one country, Croatia, who has joined the European Union as a full-fledged member. And out of the six remaining, only two are part of the formal process, while, while four are still waiting to even start the process. And that's certainly not the vision uh, projected by uh, our predecessors back in 2003 in Thessaloniki. And we sort of uh, became a bit of lazy and tired of the process and turned it into more a technical exercise. So that's why, uh, again, the, the paradoxical usefulness of uh, the tragic conflict caused by the Russia's aggression against the Ukraine is that it reminded us all that this is a, a, a very political process. This is the process that is based on adherence to European values. This is a process that the, where our future members are demonstrating that they are sharing our vision of the world, they are sharing our values, and we see that now in these difficult times uh, through their voting in the UN General Assembly, uh, through the actions they are adopting on, uh, on, on implementing sanctions against Russia, and, and this is seen and appreciated. And as I said in my first in, uh, intervention, we want to see more solutions rather than problems coming from the region. And PRESPA agreement is clearly an example that things can be done and how things can be done. So the two elements I want to stress uh, uh, about the PRESPA agreement is that first, it's a solution which is homegrown and not imported or enforced from outside. And second, it's about political will. So it, uh, it once again shows that where, if there is a will, there is a way. There are no, no unsolvable problems. But you, you really need to have political courage, responsibility, vision. Uh, as Nelson Mandela used to say, it always looks impossible until it's done. We, we've learned to live with the so-called name issue for so many years, we almost believe that there is nothing we can do about it. Now it is solved. And North Macedonia is now a member of NATO, and uh, I, 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 I expect uh, the country to start accession negotiations with the European Union very soon, and it will be well-deserved and long overdue, I would also say. So, more regional uh, solutions because there are still challenges. And of course, the easiest way, way would be the regional cooperation, as Mr. Chadesh spoke about, because right now it seems that we have more uh, regional formats than regional cooperation, because there are almost difficult to, to list them all, but you don't see much of, of real cooperation, and they are blocked for political reasons. So let's unblock, because this is really easy to do. But then there are still other, other challenges. Uh, uh, I already mentioned the, the one that I consider as the most imminent, na namely the, uh, accession, the uh, starting accession negotiations for North Macedonia and Albania. But then, of course, normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. This is a challenge which I see as the most strategic because it, it, it affects the entire region. It affects every country in the region. It affects regional atmosphere, regional cooperation. Then there is, of course, a crisis in in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which uh, unfortunately is deepening uh, as we speak, and uh, there are there are potential crises as part of this crisis later this year. This is the, certainly the most serious crisis that we are uh, we are seeing in in the region, and uh, this the, all this takes political will, and it, it takes the courage of local actors. Again, the culture of uh, asking the international community, please come and help to impose a solution that I want and ignore what the others want, must, must simply disappear from the region because this is not the way forward. It has been tried time and again. It has always failed, but it's still being tried. So we really need to understand that 
compromise is not a bad word. It has to become part of political vocabulary in the region. And uh, compromise is actually brings uh, win-win solution for everyone. And we are here, and we mean European Union, United States, and I have to say that we are uh, happy to have the best possible cooperation with, uh, with President Biden's administration, with the United States, myself, with Gabriel, because I, I think we have never been so much at the same place uh, when it comes to our understanding of the region and, and the way forward. We are speaking with one voice, and again, the history, including my personal experience, shows that whenever we, we succeeded, it was thanks to the US and, and the European Union speaking with, with one voice. So we have all the ingredients, we have the momentum, uh, so let's make sure that we will use this moment. Uh, Mr. Escobar, you spoke about the necessity to keep uh, Western Balkan countries close to Europe or inside the European Union. Uh, but in uh, 2022, uh, we saw Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova uh, applying for membership in the EU. Uh, the new applications and the change of the political landscape in Europe because of the Ukrainian war will threaten European enlargement towards Western Balkan countries, or do you think that we will see a fast-track membership for multiple countries? Well, look, I can't speak on behalf of the European Union. All I can say is that the crisis in Ukraine and the desire of Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine to want to be part of the European Union teaches us that the, the promise of Europe, the magnetism of Europe, the idea of Europe is still very much alive and well. And, and from our perspective, every country that entered the European Union became more democratic, more prosperous, and more stable. That's what we want for uh, the Western Balkans, at least. And as we go forward, it is impressive how just the idea of becoming a candidate, not even a member, but just a candidate, has created this enormous pressure for positive reforms, positive democratic reforms, positive economic reforms. And so Europe has an enormous capacity to inspire, a, an enormous capacity uh, to do great things, not just in Europe, uh, but around Europe as well. So uh, I do hope that Europe will be more present in the world alongside the United States. Uh, I do see it as a positive force in the world. I do believe that our relationship with Europe, which is based not just on, on common interests, but as Kurt said, on shared values as well, can help the world uh, help resolve, find solutions to problems. Um, so I, to answer your question, I would like to see, I don't know about a fast track. I would like to see Europe uh, extend its soft power and even its hard power uh, beyond its borders. But we do still have to remember that there are countries that have been waiting for European Union integration who have already done the hard work, such as North Macedonia and Albania, and even Montenegro, who are at the front of the line, and we should not forget them. Okay. And Mr. Volker, because of the latest uh, developments, a new transatlantic agenda is on the table of discussion between American government and the EU, especially in, uh, in the energy sector. Uh, what other role could Western Balkans countries could uh, play in this new relationship between USA and EU? Well, I think there's a couple things. Um, one of them is to be part of the effort to turn off Russian gas and Russian oil, uh, which means uh, it's transits, and it means that it is the supplies that come into the Balkans need to be coordinated with the EU and looking at LNG, possibly from the United States, possibly from Qatar or other countries, uh, looking at other oil imports, looking at renewables. So that uh, can be part of the effort to uh, reduce the, uh, the role of fossil fuels in Europe's overall energy mix as well. So I think many things uh, in that respect. Um, I think that they are, I, I think w one of the things that the European Union needs to do and the countries in the region themselves need to do is get used to thinking of these countries as contributors to Europe's goals, rather than as recipients of Europe's largesse. Uh, that they all have resources, they all have capacities, including in energy, that can help Europe achieve its goals. And by thinking that way, it can 
accelerate integration. Uh, you, you have, uh, for instance, just simple things. We, we talked about this earlier today. The LNG terminal in Kerch, the uh, development of interconnectors within the Balkans that will facilitate the flow of gas into Serbia, for example, or into Macedonia, uh, North Macedonia, uh, of non-Russian gas rather than the flow being the other way around. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think you, you get the idea is that this is an opportunity, uh, as Gabe was saying earlier, this, this is really an opportunity for the region rather than um, a potential cost or, or liability. And Mr. Cardes, um, in 2019, uh, with uh, North Macedonia and, and Albania, Serbia launched uh, the Open Balkan Initiative, which is an exemplary mechanism uh, for solutions. What are the prospects for future cooperation uh, between Balkan countries and in which areas? So after, after the start of 2019, the things moved really, really quickly between the three countries, and I hope that we will see also other uh, three countries very soon as a part of the whole. Why? Because the Open Balkan Initiative is the initiative which is coming from the ground, from the, from the, from the bottom, if you want. And it is actually negotiating between our institutions how to build a common market, how to move people, goods, and capital faster between us. This is one step, and this is our homework. On the other side, all that work between us is irrelevant if we cannot reach the point how we, as a region, communicate with the European Union, and what are the perspectives, and what are the steps on that way? Is this something that I can see in two years, or in four years, or it is something which is the process actually stuck, and everybody is, you know, blaming, like, Balkan is not for the reforms, or EU is not for the new members, and we can, like, provide it for the next 20 years. And I think it is the joint effort. We have, we need, the EU showed now, in this crisis times, that they, they can act unity, that they can be unified, and now we have to do this extra mile, to work together on the solutions that will provide a better integration of the Western Balkans into the EU and having a tangible results. As we have a tangible result between communicating, you know, before uh, Open Balkan, there was no communication between ministers. My friend will agree from Northern Macedonia, uh, from, for example, agriculture minister between them. They have known each other. Now they are communicating every week. They're going on the phone. The people are communicating. People are dealing with every week some, some meetings of the people who are arranging and implementing how to, uh, for the trucks not to stop on the border, how the veterinarian uh, inspections are doing, how to mutually recognize all the certificates, so on. It is coming from the countries itself. It is not imposed. Uh, 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 initiative. It is coming from the countries itself. And you know, the, the, the main question that we have to, 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 to ask ourselves, are we contributors or do we want to be some kind of, you know, take us with you because, you know, otherwise we are dead. No, we are contributors. You know, if you see Western Balkans today, every year, since four years, five years, Western Balkans is exporting 30% each year more on software and IT than the year ahead, before. So basically, Serbia is today exporting 1.7 billion euros of software every year, with 6.7 or 7 million people. Turkey is exporting 460 million euros of software with 82 million people. So something is changing. The, the Balkans and the countries there are not the same. About different things and why I think we have to, you know, do it together. About energy security and energy diversification, the colleague told us we are actually also dependent on the energy and the gas and natural gas uh, from, not, from one third. But you know, we have since the beginning of the war in Croatia, and uh, 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 there, was, there was a pipeline, gas pipeline was built, and there is, I think, 50 kilometers, correct me if I'm wrong, left on both sides to connect actually Kirk with Serbia, uh, with the gas, natural gas pop pipeline. So, and all these years back, nobody came from the European Union and said, hey, let us do it together. Let us invest this money and build this pipeline because it's good to have uh, uh, diversification. It's good to have also another energy source. But now, when it's a problem, 
then we are coming and saying, please, let's do it together because we need it. We need, and this will change also the relations between Croatia and Serbia. Of course it will change because, because we are dependent on each other. I'm talking from the, from the standpoint of the companies. Now you can see all the big companies in, in the region, in the Western Balkans, be it in Northern Macedonia and Montenegro and in Serbia or in Albania, we are, they, they are active in all the region. They're active in Croatia. Croatian companies are active in Serbia. So th we are applying the same rules, the same uh, mechanisms, the same laws that we want to apply. So I don't see why we cannot implement this in the political processes that we have. Why to leave the political processes from two centuries ago and not starting to change the political processes together? It's not the question, let wait what the international community is coming. No, it's, I think this is a joint interest. This is our joint interest. Because if you see Europe now, I don't think that we are accomplished the project of Europe. And if we do not that, and as a European Union, as a Europe, Europe you know, Maybe you can see it like that. We had a situation on a smaller scale like this when the you know, nationalistic and crazy regime of Milosevic started the wars. And you know, all the positive thing that happened at that time is that Romania and Bulgaria were pushed in the European Union. Imagine European Union today without Bulgaria and Romania in this situation. Imagine. So this is not everything about, you know, administrations, it's not everything about public administrations, procedures, it's also about thinking the future together. Okay, so you mentioned the future. I want a short uh, comment from all of you about how do you imagine the future of uh, Western Balkan countries? Uh, they will be inside or outside European Union? Let me start with you, Mr. Bitiki. Easy to say. <laughs> Fully, full members of the European Union, with uh, involved, fully involved in the value chain of the European uh, economy, uh, not depending from in the value chain and semiconductors produced in China and other parts, but produced in Europe, in Western Balkans, or outside, but uh, inside Europe, uh, with uh, I would say uh, much higher. Uh, uh, interdependence between the members of the European Union, less dependent from the countries outside Europe, or at least saying and being more open uh, with the countries that we know that uh, we should not uh, uh, support uh, because of their behavior, but with the alliance that are striking to have a better world. There I see the future of Western Balkans. In how many years do you expect that <laughs> to be a full member of European Union? In June, we start negotiation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, I never uh, answer the question about time because you, you know, you have not started running, and I cannot say how long will it take you, you know, to complete. Twenty-seven years. We are no, no. Running, it, so. it took. Yeah, I know. I know. For my country, Slovakia, it took thirty-six months to complete the accession negotiation process, but uh, I don't think it's doable now. Nonetheless, I mean, I don't see any other future uh, other than uh, the full membership in the European Union. Uh, I was part of my own country's accession process, and I know how much it changed my country, how much it changed the, the way people live, how much it improved living standards, uh, improved the international standing of my country, and that's why I am investing so much of my time and, and energy to help the countries of the Western Balkans to, to belong to, to the same club, a club that delivers political stability, economic prosperity, and the highest in the world's uh, standards of protection of, of rights of, of individuals and, and, and vulnerable groups. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, uh, the enthusiasm has uh, disappeared, and we have turned this process into technical exercise. And uh, our language has also become very technical, and it's full of benchmarks uh, and chapters and, uh, and rule of law and chapters 23, 24. Uh, so uh, again, we need the crisis like the war uh, uh, in Ukraine to realize that actually what we are speaking about is, um, is, a, is a very political process, as I already said, and I'm not going to repeat myself, but also to realize that what some people in the European Union were saying some years back, that Western Balkans can wait. They are in the safe place, they are parked in a safe place, and we need to focus on our internal things, and once we are done with our internal things, then we can look uh, what can we do with Western Balkans. And they were wrong, and it was clear, but now they see they were wrong. 
we, 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 we do not have the luxury of waiting. We have the capacity of addressing the issues to bring Western Balkans into our family in parallel uh, to addressing our problems. Because what's the risk? Uh, I do not see a risk coming from uh, Russia or China. I, I see the risk coming from uh, ourselves. I see mm -hmm. the risk of uh, people losing their hopes and their uh, beliefs in European values. And I would see this uh, weakening European forces and bringing uh, more to the forefront forces who believe in non-democratic, authoritarian, illiberal uh, ideas. And I think this clash is happening in the region right now. And if we want Europe, the Balkans, we don't want to lose the Balkans to ourselves, not to the third country, but to ourselves. And we can win over the Balkans, we can have the European Balkans only if we offer a credible uh, membership perspective, not one day, but with a, based on a very transparent, very clear rules and, and, and which we will be respected not only by them, but also by us. Okay. And Mr. Escobar is in America's interest to see Western Balkan countries inside the European Union. 100 percent. They're already some of our closest partners. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, uh, the partnership that we have with Albania, North Macedonia, Montenegro and NATO, it's phenomenal. Uh, and so I, don't, I endorse everything that my colleagues have said, but I do want to talk about timing. Uh, and if you think about it this way, a child who finished secondary school at the time of Dayton if we wait another 15 years, that child will be entering his pension very shortly after that. That's not a very good promise. That's not a very solid promise. That's not any way to deliver. <laughs> right. so, so I do want to talk about time. Uh, and it has to be very quick. And, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Volker. Sure. Well, let me just pick up where Gabe left off, because that's exactly what I was thinking as well. I agree completely with what Miro said. but. The way I would put this is we have been through a period of time, uh, it's hard to put a finger on exactly how much, but a period of time in which Euro the European Union thought that enlargement to the Balkans was impossible. Just too much, they're not ready, we enlarge too quickly already, uh, we have enlargement fatigue, we have to absorb what we've already done. All of this, it's impossible. I think we have just entered a new period of time. I think we're now in a period of time where it is going to look possible. And this means that it is partly capturing that moment in the EU. Miro, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Convince everybody. Capture that moment. But then the second is for the countries in the region, you know, put your foot on the gas now do everything possible to meet the criteria to open and close the chapters with the EU. Um, make yourselves just like any other European country as quickly as possible, because we don't know how long this window will stay open again. Uh, it is easy for people to become complacent and fall back on habits when things are calm. Uh, I was in Brussels just a couple days ago, and they again reminded me the, the cliche in Brussels the EU invents itself through crises. And this is a crisis now that we are in, and the EU is, in, is again inventing itself. So it's important to take advantage of the moment. Thank you. And Mr. Cadiz, what's your message to you, the so European Union? So basically, I have a very clear, as My Americans case. would say, call for action. <laughs> 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 and that is what I, what I tried to express. And it is, let's start or convince the EU to offer to Western Balkans clear perspective as a first step, two steps. The second one is the full membership. The first is offering the European Economic Treaty for all six countries with a clear committed uh, 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 condition that has to be met there all in all our capitals about the single market. Single market plus Copenhagen criteria, we can reach it. There is a process. Let's build up on, on this idea. Let's start to negotiate the treaty now on the end of the French presidency. Let's close the treaty on the Swedish president, and then every country should put the gas and okay. really go uh, fast forward, because then there are the goals. There are the goals to be met, and you can really proceed quickly. 
on the first step and then go further and talk about full membership. Okay, and Mr. Bittiki, would you like something to add just, just for just, 30 just seconds? Just a slight answer on Mr. Wolk. We are doing our homework. We know exactly what we have to do and we are working every day, no matter that uh, in every step that we do, the, the door is again closed. We are yes. doing, but now we have and we need stronger commitment because unfortunately the answer whether and when we will become member of the European Union, half million from my country in the last 20 years are part of the European Union already, probably half million in upcoming 10 years will go as well if they don't see future in our, in our region. So this is, is the answer. Is, Today is where the, the people of Western Balkan will anyway be part of the European Union, but only moving from the Western Balkan to European Union, or we will join together and really make the, the best effort we can to include we, us. And we hope so. Which Thank you very much for this very useful discussion about Western Balkans. It was an honor to have you here with us in Delphi Economic Forum, and I think that you enlightened us for many topics. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.